will bring to the table. Uh, we have uh, Professor Girishnath Jha, who's actually developed, uh, who's a professor, who's actually developed a, a, a corpora or training data or da clean data around Indian languages uh, and done, and not just, you know, what I was, my, when I was doing my research, 17 different languages, they've actually built tagged corpora for 17 different languages. Uh, and uh, you know that experience is incredible and worth tapping into to see what does it mean, what can we learn from that process. We have Kostov, uh, Kostov Dev Viswas. You know, Kostov, uh, what has been uh, absolutely fascinating about your own journey is uh, you've really seen the arc of AI and ML in different areas. You've been an entrepreneur yourself. You're a technologist, and now you're actually you've been working as a fellow at CPR, working on the Land Rights Initiative. You've actually been working on property-related legal data. Uh, so, you know, what have you seen and, the, you know, your perspective is absolutely critical. Shilpa Kumar, Shilpa, uh, you know, uh, what's super valuable is you, before uh, being an investment partner at, at Omidya, you were MD and CEO of ICICI Securities and you come from that financial sector, which has been absolutely transformed by data and uh, bringing in that perspective and seeing not just from that perspective, but also what are you seeing as critical strategic investments that are being made in this space. So we have a group that can really open up this conversation, make it pop, and uh, look at dimensions of it that will be important for us. And this is not a conversation that we want to have just for the sake of having a conversation. This is a conversation we want to have because we feel that this is an important area where work needs to be done, and that work has to be collaborative work. So treat this as an invitation to move forward and do collaborative work. So to get started today, I want to, uh, you know, uh, just share a little story. And this is a story uh, that is probably familiar in the tech, very, it's, a, it's a legend almost in the technology circles, but it's a story of uh, this lady called Fei-Fei Li. And uh, Fei-Fei Li, uh, about uh, 12 years back, you know, she, she was at Stanford and uh, the, she saw a situation. She saw that the way technology was evolving, uh, especially uh, in artificial intelligence, they had a very specific problem. Computers, in order to become the, you know, really intelligent, needed to understand language, needed to understand images, and be able to say, you know, what is it? What are they seeing? Otherwise, there's a limit to how much intelligence really you can, uh, you know, give a computer. And at that point in time, the way of training computers to uh, to understand what they were seeing on the screen was actually to model out like, oh, this is a cat. So it's got a circle on its head and it's got a triangle. It's got two little triangles on the side and here's what a cat looks like. But anyone who has a cat, cats don't look like that all the time. Cats can be under something, curled up. So there's no, so you know, the crazy thing was that these, this sort of model that we're going to teach, you're going to create spell structured models and tell computers, this is what it looks like. That wasn't really working. And Fai Fai Li had a pivotal insight that we need to train computer. We need to trust uh, the way uh, computer intelligence is evolving and train computers like children. We need to expose them uh, to huge amounts of pictures and get them to figure out that this is the pattern of a cat. It's not about a circle on the head. It's not, hey, this is the pattern. It could look like this, it could look like that. But if you train the computer with enough images, uh, of a cat in various situations, cat under the table, cat on top of a tree, cat on the uh, cat eating something. Your ultimately the computer will figure out what a cat looks like in any situation. And the only challenge that she encountered was how much data do you need to train the computer <laughs> to do that? And uh, Fai Fai Li created uh, what, became, what became a pivotal project called ImageNet. And it was a collaboration of Stanford and Princeton. And they ultimately generated a billion candidate images and finally 14 million clean images, which were used and today have become like a foundation of image recognition in the world of machine learning and AI. And uh, what's, what, another data point that drove me crazy was 50,000 people worked on this project. Uh, and a lot of them in India using Amazon Mechanical Turk. So people did their bits to say, here's an image, this is what it's saying. Here's an image, this is... So it became this massively spread out project where everybody contributed to create, uh, to say, here is an image I found on the internet of a cat doing this, and here is an image, and, and somebody was cleaning up that. So it was this incredibly massive collaborative project that resulted in a huge boom. And you know, I, I find that deeply inspiring, that that combination of human ingenuity, that data, that, that labeled data that started, that could be used to train computers, 
and of course the computer algorithms that were anyway strong that combination resulted in a burst of intelligence and that to me is an inspiration for you know even this conversation what is that image net for law and justice what does that look like and how can we build something that can ultimately dramatically accelerate access to justice in our country in the next 2 5 10 years that's the big question in front of us so uh, with that massive challenge uh, and with that big uh, goal in front of us let me begin by asking uh, shilpa a question shilpa what are the possibilities and when you answer this question uh, feel free to also uh, reflect on any other sector you've seen transformed what are the possibilities shilpa are we getting shilpa uh yeah shilpa yeah yeah yes. um, yeah good evening everyone um i hope you can hear me sachin can you hear me? yeah yes so i i actually want to say you know um uh if you consider two of the sectors with hello yeah shilpa we are with you go for it uh such yeah 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 so i say i've i've lived through you know two sectors which have seen a dramatic change uh, in terms of what was happening in the sector because of technology and data uh, one is the banking sector the other is security sector is the consumer benefited uh in in very very significant ways i mean if you consider securities market around the time uh, i started working which tells you my age uh you know at that time uh it was really open out we did not have a tech platform which enabled trading uh and there was a lot of fear that what will happen when the securities market goes uh you know digital uh the the great news is not only did the consumer benefit in terms of lower costs greater access to liquidity but the resultant increase in the whole mutual fund industry uh you know the whole shift uh, uh, i would say a whole new community got created fund managers financial advisors uh, fintech platforms uh, knowledge platform uh and therefore what you really saw was the consumer benefited the community benefited flip side of that is corporate india could access funds cheaper because there was more money flowing in uh and therefore you know really uh, technology and data can be extremely transformative and one of the reasons omidya really believes in this is uh, we think any problem if you put entrepreneurs if you put technology you might have some good outcomes in terms of options uh, for going forward really our belief is if the goal is access uh surely technology and data could be a good starting point together thank you shilpa that's uh, super so i think you know what in what you said and there was little bits that we lost uh, uh, some of the connection but i think uh, it came to us i think we got the gist of it but i think uh, in what you said what i find most insightful is the unexpected outcomes which are now today kind of expected in the sense but like the fact that really it it ends ends up building ecosystems you know when you see new possibilities especially when you bring data into a system you see new possibilities that you may not have conceived of earlier so one thing which for instance is happening in the legal sector which i find interesting is people are saying this is why we need the data but the crazy thing that you're pointing out is the way it works is both ways right you might say this is why we need the data but when the data comes there's a thousand other possibilities that emerge and that i think is really exciting and uh, a theme we should remember that what we may not completely know what comes out of it uh, but by itself it's incredibly valuable thanks shilpa i want to bring uh, a question here on just just reality check on where we are so where are we you know i i believe in um, in 2018 there was a huge leap where google essentially uh, published some technology uh, uh, bert uh, as it's called which had a huge tremendously it moved the envelope on a computer's understanding text 
And apparently that was quite pivotal. And I am no technologist, but in my reading, it seems to have been a big shift. But uh, Vivek, let me ask you, uh, what were the implications of this evolution or leap in computers understanding free text? Yeah, I think, uh, uh, thanks, uh, thanks, Sachin. And, and I think that uh, just, you know, I just, I mean, going back to the ImageNet example that you had talked about, uh, ImageNet came out probably, and that was the, that, that was a data-driven thing, then ImageNet itself came about maybe in 2008, nine. And probably by 2012 was the first time that a deep learning uh, system became better than the other systems. And about 2015 was the time when computers started seeing better than humans, okay? So therefore, you know, when you say given an image and a human has to classify, 2015 is probably the year when we started seeing better than humans. And now, in, now it's not even close. Actually, uh, it, it is actually computers can actually understand an image, uh, uh, you know, especially uh, given sufficient training significantly better than, than, than a human can. Uh, and the same thing, at least, you know, that is, you know, what happened in 2015 in, in, in the case of image actually started happening in 2018 in the case of text and, and, and understanding of text. And there was, there's basically, there's many different ways by which you can understand how well a computer understands text. And, you know, one of the benchmarks which is used is what is known as the Stanford uh, question answer database where you know, you, there is, you're, you're given a paragraph and those who've taken SAT or GRE or an exam, something like that, would know that you know, you're, given a, you're given a paragraph and then you're given a free text question and you have to identify where in that paragraph the answer to that question lies. And uh, so in 2018, for the first time uh, after this BERT, you know, and, and, this, uh, this, uh, and this was basically, uh, um, was the first time that, uh, and by the way, the reason that BERT came across, which is very interesting, is slightly different from the uh, ImageNet thing, because in ImageNet, you had what is known as labeled data. And, and obviously labeled data is, 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 is something that you need to do a lot of work to create labeled data. But what uh, Google did, and, and, and Google, this is, even though it was done by Google, is, a, is an open source thing. Uh, but what Google did was basically, it tried to, so th there's two things that it tried to, pr it, it, it took basically all of Wikipedia or, or some very, very large corpus of text, and then basically hid certain words from the, from, the, from, from the training. And then it tried to train to predict those words correctly. And so therefore, since it had the original text to begin with, you actually didn't need to actively label it. And therefore you had a massive data set to actually train these things both backward and forward. And as a result of this, you actually created the, for the first time, you could answer questions. Uh, an, an, an AI program was able to answer questions from a given text better than, the, better than a human could do that from reading the same text. Now, of course, they changed the benchmark. And, and I think they should, because I was, for many years, uh, you know, AI was not coming close to, to what humans could do, but suddenly they blew past it. And then they, they actually created new benchmarks, which is the right thing to do. Uh, in fact, the most interesting thing, the original version of the, the question answer benchmark was actually such that, you know, if you, uh, you know, uh, the original was, was that it would give you the best possible answer. And maybe in sometimes the answer wasn't there in that text at all. And so the second version is they tried to create those kinds of data sets where you ask a question whose answer doesn't exist in the text. And you know, still see whether the computer is. Doing. And it, we've made now steady progress. Every few weeks, people are. I mean, a few weeks and months uh, performance on these squad data sets. Are, so that just un, unleashed a new kind of thing. And and that I mean, already uh, the concept of transformers in areas of translation, etc., were actually still already becoming better. So it's it's uh, and so therefore it's this this quantum leap happened uh, before because of but. And you know, and BERT was created because you ran something on a massive, massive amount of data. Got so, it. no, and you know, at first I, I love the names, right? Like Squad, BERT. <laughs> I, I, you know, I love how the technology sector just trips out on creating its own little acronyms. But uh, I, I did, and you know, what was fascinating was that uh, this leap of, uh, you know, helping computers understand text in context 
like basically so that you know you know this it's not just understanding words it's also understanding the meaning of a sentence yeah. and and place and especially long sentences and i think that suddenly i'm sure if i was uh, in the legal space or whatever i'm suddenly thinking oh my god you know like what is where is this going uh, so i think that's really fascinating that that leap has happened let me uh, take that uh, thing on the leap and i'll come uh, you know vivek you raised this question of the question and answer and i learned something interesting about some of the early work on the legal data on questions and answers i'll pick that up and come back later but costa i want to come to you and ask you so does this progress make it easier to read a paragraph of judicial reasoning or a judgment or a section of a law where does this place us yeah uh, thanks for that um yeah good evening everyone um as a background um i first of all i really share the excitement that vivek brought to the table i mean it's ex exciting time and last few years have seen a a, a a a sea change in in nlp um but um legal text is is a specialized form of natural language so it's not uh, exactly the way we uh, it's definitely a natural language <laughs> um yeah it, it basically does not read um, you know it it doesn't read like the way we are used to in our everyday conversational exchanges or language on the web and uh, some of these neural models um which achieved amazing performance in language analysis uh, translation and even language generation um these models um are all trained over uh, this general corpus um you know of natural language uh, and second uh, you know it's also trained on uh, much shorter text forms um you know like comments reviews posts and tweets uh, and and this because of this um some of these off the shelf pre trained neural models uh, do not yet perform as as well as we would like them to and especially um you know we were, we benchmarked them against like some of the more classical machine learning like you know um you know i, I don't want to be too technical but um linear uh, support vector machines like some of them still um actually do some of these classify uh, legal documents better than uh, neural language models um you know i would uh, you know just uh, talk about like what we are doing at at land rights initiative at uh, cpr um we, we uh, are looking at uh, supreme court judgments on land rights for the last uh, from the 1950s and um what we saw was exactly so that linear svms um are like the traditional machine learning algorithms are actually performing slightly better so i i think um you know and also the this is uh, also echoed by other researchers in in another part of the world like singapore um management university they uh, in 2019 last year um they they posted some results and they also found a similar uh, kind of results uh, when comparing and benchmarking different kind of classifiers so um i, I think you know it's uh, it's both exciting but also there's a lot of work to do to um you know look at the neural models and their architecture and try to see like you know how can we experiment with their the hyperparameters word embeddings and uh, all you know the whole architecture and see like how um, you know we can uh, apply them on on neural net uh, on on legal text in the same with the, to get the same kind of successes so yes i share the excitement but there are some caveats and you know some work <laughs> so what i what i hear you saying at some level is that there are different approaches of course in in uh, the technology part of it because it's not just that the only approach is the bert approach there are some other approaches but uh, importantly uh, is it is it correct to say that both these approaches require you to train uh, these the software with data like you require clean structured data to train these solutions like are uh, is the data that is available in the way in in the in the form that you want it to use this technology uh yes um i think generally in machine learning um you need um you know some training data there are certain like you know it, it also depends on the problem you're trying to solve like for example uh, vivek uh, his work uh, you know it, it it is not as dependent like we used a lot of uh, like supervised uh machine learning um in our work so uh, structured data and uh, you know and and often labeled data is is very valuable 
Uh, however, I, I think data access is still a big issue in India, uh, you know, in spite of the promise of like the National Informatics Center with its Judas platform. Uh, I think there's no API access still. like, you know, the, the bulk access to um, is, is restricted and, you know, behind captures, et cetera. Um, and, uh, you know, a lot of these uh, documents and, and court judgments, et cetera, may not be uh, machine readable, even if you have the documents. So there's a little bit of machine learning just to parse um, and, and get uh, like the text. Um, and most of uh, what we do is still dependent on like uh, providers like Manupatra and, and the documents are in the form of PDF and DOCX. So there's a little bit of work to get the data. Um, and if you look at uh, legal text broadly, I mean, you can include like patents and contracts and public uh, financial filings, law enforcement records, all of that. I mean, there's a lot to be done when you think about like access to data in the, in the legal space. Um, and uh, even if once you have the data, um, you know, there are various kinds of inconsistencies across the structure and form, owing to the large number of courts and, you know, the large, like, you know, the, the source of the data is, is disparate and across our nation. We have regional languages, um, something again, which uh, Vivek is very close to. Um, and, and so research units have to figure out homegrown ways to deal with a lot of this, uh, the cleanup exercises before they can actually start analyzing. So um, I think the opportunity and the grand task in our space lies somewhere here is, is bringing this giant corpus of legal data to a place where it's more um, readily machine readable and analyzable. I think uh, it's probably the biggest threat to any progressive research moving forward and innovation in this ecosystem. So what I hear you, and I'm gonna to come to Vivek uh, just as a follow up to this, I hear two things, right? One is the access to the raw data, just easy access to raw data. And the other is that even if you get this data, uh, you have to do a lot of cleaning up and stuff so that you can then train the systems to make sense of the raw data, right? You need training data sets. So you need both the access to the raw data, but you also need to do effort to make sure that it's in a form so that you can actually use it with the technology that can understand uh, data, right? So Because just to make it clear to everybody here who's not from a completely technological domain, uh, these, these new technologies that are there in order to just the way ImageNet required all those images, and I know this may not be a perfect analogy, but let me still use it. Just the way ImageNet required these labeled images to help the computer understand the patterns, you will require clean legal data so that the computers, so that the, the technology can actually understand the raw data and say, okay, this is a section of a law. This is a reasoning. This is, and some of it, of course, is, is beyond computers right now, but ultimately makes sense of a paragraph of reasoning and find the conclusion in a judgment. So uh, just to make it clear for everybody, uh, there, there are these two needs, the general data, as well as the clean uh, structured data. So you can actually train software to become its full potential. Picking up on that, uh, and feel free to correct me at any point, but picking up on that, let me ask you this, uh, Vivek, just as a follow-up, which is, in your experience, what is your feeling, right? How much data, like how, how, how big an effort is this to create the clean data that is required to train these NLP solutions so that they can start to generate value uh, and outcomes in the legal and law and justice space? Yeah, so, uh, so firstly, I think uh, this uh, two, two, two things. Obviously, access to the raw data is something that is important. And clearly, you know, there are the questions of API access and things like that. But I think our goal is to actually create tools that actually once you get the data, then you are able to get it in a form that is that usable by, uh, by, or by these NLP tools. And, and you know, we are focused on translation, but the, most of the cleanup work that we are doing is actually not necessarily uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, restricted to just uh, machine translation kind of, uh, you know, that is a translation kind of work. Uh, and I think the, uh, the interesting thing is, and that's actually our goal, is to create these, uh, to create these data sets and make it usable and make it available to people. That's part of the, you know, I'm, and, and, and here talking, uh, I'm part of what is known as Project Anuvad, where, where basically the goal is to, to, to develop translations in Indian languages. And actually the legal domain is one of the early domains that we have been, uh, we have been working in. And I think more important in that, uh, uh, in, in the data set is to actually create, take data from various sources, and if you know, so we we are building pipelines that include OCRs 
in various you know indic languages and then there are uh, various kinds of uh, you know the, and and how the data needs to be converted and and you know somebody has a pdf somebody has a docx some is something else all of those data to actually take it and convert it into a form that is accessible to basically these tools and then we want to create these corpuses and i think that that is really the i mean i think that the whole point is to create these corpuses that whoever wants to use it and can then make the best use of it and in fact it is our stated goal and and i, I think in legal data alone i'm saying this year we will create larger translation corpuses in indian languages than occur in any other domain i mean i think that our goal because we are not using completely manual techniques to do something like this we are using lots of programmatic techniques and our intent stated goal is to actually i mean in fact today uh, the largest open even take in a language like hindi okay the largest available publicly available data set to actually a translation between english and hindi is something from iit bombay which is actually probably have 1.5 million sentences which are parallel and we think that we will be you know many many times more than that in legal data alone uh, in hindi this year okay so so and i think so but because we see that creating the data is almost as important as the final output that we are generating and making it available uh, to all kinds of people so it's a non trivial thing it's a lot of dirty work it's not you know a, 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 but 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 the, but the the the, the you, unless you put in the hard yards i mean you know in in pretty much you know i might have interest in in languages in in various things and we have actually i mean despite you know having some of the i mean you know uh, many of the indian languages are among the most spoken and and most uh, written languages in the world the amount of data that is available for these classes of tools is in the public domain is very small and then you know therefore then we are dependent on the googles and the uh you know the 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 big players in in the world because they are the only ones who have that data and uh, so it's it's something that that uh, that uh, that and and we we are working in the in the legal domain and uh, we have uh, actually uh, you know developed translations from uh, between nine indian languages right now nine indian languages and in in the legal domain uh, i think you know uh, we we think uh, we are we are better than than google or something that you can actually see in 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 that kind of thing and we've actually built many utilities also because we recognize that even in the area of translation right you don't get a 100% correct uh translation in something like that so even if you're like it's, but we've actually built a whole bunch of interactive tools which uh, which actually help you get you know help you actually complete some a task like that significantly faster than you could otherwise so vivek that sounds like you've gone at a particularly hard problem at a time when one would think you you should nibble at stuff like is it it seems seems like a really hard problem like translating legal language in other indian languages means you have to first understand the legal language in english so uh, yeah let me comment on that point it's actually interesting that while legal language is more uh, complicated it is actually ending up being a little bit more structured than 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 general uh, language so actually if you train with data that comes from legal language uh, you know it actually uh, is uh, you know and 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 i, I don't know uh, i wasn't prepared for, maybe i i'll share our websites and people can actually go and try these things out uh, but uh, you know and 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 uh, but but the thing is that we uh, you know it's it's interesting that even though legal sentences are more complicated translating them ends up becoming uh, you know it, it's actually it's quite possible to use these techniques to come up with with good translations now sometimes it does it wrong so therefore you can't you know believe it, it's not 100% but it is quite amazing uh, that uh, that uh, how good it can become so i see i see Yeah. and hey just to clarify something so what i hear you saying mm -hmm. is that what you're doing is you're at some level automating the process of even generating the clean data right like you have you're putting out a repository of tools and yeah. the data both mm -hmm. yes uh, and ultimately you are confident that that tools and data can then be built upon by other people in various directions yes. so at some level you are developing a kind of commons Uh, yes which is going to be instrumental for more types of meaning making for uh, from legal data 
absolutely and I, and i think the tools everything we do is open source uh, this is in project anwa there is completely open source and complete and, and available for anybody who wants to build on it because we realize that our languages are not something that you know and and, and legal of course is a, is is a specific domain that we've decided to kind of work on is something that we need to uh, you know get many people working on got it and uh, got you know and because we are not uh, you know we are not a commercial entity <laughs> this is uh, we we want actually to to actually have this kind of uh, collaboration and innovation to to take things forward so let me ask a quick follow up there uh, cost of i want to just also ask jameson uh, who else is creating these kind of training data repositories or even tools to generate clean uh, training data who else is building maybe costa i can ask you or jameson whoever wants to go uh, and i'll come back to you vivek but are you familiar with other such initiatives that are creating these foundational pieces for different sectors doesn't have to be legal or in law would be great <laughs> you know to know i haven't come across that many sure yeah, yeah. hi and uh, thank you uh, sachin for for having me on the call it's it's been a pleasure just listening to all of the experts um so there are a couple examples of legal data sets there are a number of researchers uh, throughout the United States and in the UK, at least those that I'm familiar with, uh, who've been working on this. Um, the Free Law Project is one. They've been trying to create a, a repository, an open repository, a free repository of case law in the United States, and have been working for a number of years as a nonprofit on that project. Um, there's the Case Law Access Project at Harvard. Uh, Harvard working with a company called Ravel, which is now owned by LexisNexis, um, digitized the entire Harvard Law Library. And now they're going through the process of trying to make sense of it, to structure it, to build tools on top of it. Um, so that's been making real progress over the past couple of years. And in fact, I think there's maybe two or three years left in the contract before it's free. Um, and so that's a really, really exciting thing. There are a number of other university centers uh, at Georgia State University. There's a legal analytics lab and they focused on pulling together data, whether it's um, legal financial data, regulatory data, uh, court data, criminal law uh, data. Uh, but most of this work has been for academic uh, research projects, less on the pure NLP um, Got uh, it. training, training for models, but there is a lot out there that's happening right now. That is super insight. Uh, Costa, anything you're familiar with? Um, in India, uh, most of the work, I mean, is, you know, there's a lot of quantitative analysis that is happening around law. A um, lot of independent researchers uh, in universities or, you know, in, in centers of, for legal policy, they're building up these, uh, you know, they're, they're sharing results. And often, like you can backtrack and try to create like training data for them, but I don't think the motivation uh, of these researchers is to build training data. Yeah, it is. It is. It is more like you know uh, they are they have problems and questions, and they are trying to answer them using reports. And often, the the data backing those reports are out there, and they are published, and you can access them. But if you're thinking of uh, case analysis and training machines for case analysis, you can use that, that, that they, those data sets, but there's a little bit of work to do to kind of make them, take them. Got it, that far, yeah. got it. That's, yeah. Vivek, anything you want to add in there? No, I mean, uh, I think uh, what I'd like to say is that, yes, part of it is a is, is little bit of a, you have to have a little bit of a, 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 a you know, a never say die approach. I mean, yeah, yeah, we have captures, but we did, I mean, we pretty much have downloaded uh, every single judgment from the Supreme Court in these last ten years. <laughs> there'll be many. There'll be many in this audience, Vivek, who will smile and share a, a coffee with you on that topic. But we will not, we will not go into it officially. Yeah. No. No. And 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 so no. I, and so the, what I'm saying is that uh, obviously uh, you know you've got to do what you have to do, but uh, but uh, but I think that uh, 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 but uh, you know I think that the the data is there uh, to be. Um, the data is there uh, if, if, we, if we work on it. But I think that these things need to become open. And those are, the, are not the reasons, actually. In fact, uh, not having that data. I mean, and, and frankly, I'm sure, I mean, going back many years may become a little bit harder. But at least, you know, 15, 20 years in all courts, we should have uh, all the data. And then so many different things can actually uh, be done, uh, be done uh, using that. And, and I think that there are other people who are actually doing uh, similar things and actually doing different kinds of things, kind of a, a, a legal, you know, uh, 
question and answer things. I know I know companies which are actually working on those kinds of things. And 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 you know, uh, obviously they. I don't know exactly how they do, but they do have access to uh, to this to this Got data. It. Yeah. And I think uh, you know the thought that comes to my mind is, uh, you know, it's the thought of every opportunistic entrepreneur, which is how do we, how can we at this point in time, given the present state of circumstances, how can we accelerate this future? So if I was to bring that question to to uh, Costa, uh, you and uh, uh, Jameson and Vivek as well, like how do we accelerate this future? If you said, if you had to, uh, all of you committed from enough visibility into the entrepreneurial world and said, let's focus on this. Uh, I think Vivek, you've touched on one part, the raw act, the access to the raw data. Uh, mm -hmm. If you can build on that, uh, mm -hmm. how do we access, uh, you know, this future? I would, that would be great. Maybe Costa, I'll start off with you and then move around. Yeah, I mean, see, we are talking about uh, you know trying to analyze like systems of justice in society. So it's a it's a it's a it's a hard one to kind of point out that one thing that we will do will change the game, um, especially where we are at right now. I think we are at the very early stage. Um, I mean, and it'll take an ecosystem of different kinds of innovation to come together from data providers opening up to uh, the research community asking the right questions and technologies building these kind of engineering solutions. Um, but um, where we are at right now, um, I, I think, you know, the, some of the, uh, you know, some the, other than like just sharing data, um, Vivek also pointed out like, you know, sharing tools and, and all the, the software that, that, you know, will help researchers quickly analyze. Um, I think, yeah, um, I can see like sharing models, like once we have trained models, uh, different researchers can kind of put, put them in a commons, which you have brought up many times. Um, I think right now that's where we're at. Um, um, it's it's about building a, a large corpus of um, both uh, data benchmarks, uh, you know, models, and and uh, yeah, I think that that's where we're at right now. Got it. Got it. Uh, uh, Vivek. Uh, in in terms of acceleration i think uh, i think one of the things that we do see is is the fact that i think oh, oh, one of the things that's very interesting especially in in this whole area of ai is that uh, is that you know most of the code in, in even the latest technologies even something was 3 weeks ago actually gets open sourced and what doesn't get open sourced is actually the data so actually having so whatever we do and any utility anything you build if there is that concept of sharing and you use it for different purposes. And I think that that's the, only, that's the way that we can actually accelerate that if everybody shares what they have. And I think that that's uh, now, obviously sometimes if there are commercial, uh, uh, you know, interests, things, things actually may not go in that direction. But then some of the things that you have to understand is that how we move forward as, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a domain, okay, depends on how much, we want to share and i think that's that's and i think that that is the important thing that people have to have a little bit of a long term view i mean as i said right as as a former entrepreneur i'm i i don't actually have any uh, thing against somebody who's who's doing something for profit but actually see that actually if you actually work together and build things together i mean for example i and this is a general ai question not really legal or nlp question I see that a lot of people in AI seem to think that data is their is their kind of uh, you know is their sticky uh, special sauce or their USP, and actually that's in, that's a very short term view. I mean, if that's the case, then the only people who will win is Google and Facebook and others, and we are, everybody else is actually building silos of little data sets which may be good for something in particular. And then you know, if you look at it from a larger perspective, we all lose. So <laughs> I think. <laughs> One thought that comes to my mind, I want to ask Girish this question, which is, you know, the sharing culture, a small startup could very easily say that, you know, like, why should we share? I mean, the only thing we have is these tools, these models, like there could be this mindset or this data that is hard won because in India, there's not, not even an API. So how do you trigger sharing cultures? I'm, I'm curious in the, in the linguistics domain, Girish, you've done painstaking work on the corpora for Indian languages. Like, how, did you encounter the situation of how do you develop some, how do you really build an ecosystem, a community of people who are willing to share, who are willing to collaborate, even if they had been working on it separately? Any insights there, Girish? I have to unmute Girish. 
Yeah, thank you, Sachin, and good to connect with everybody. Yeah, the data creation in India has been a huge issue. People are not aware that data is so important and sharing data is uh, more important than actually creating it. And we had a issue actually when we created a consortium of 17 universities and trying to sensitize every language group that we have to create data as per certain standard and then be able to see each other's data and, and comment on it. And not only that, after we create the data, data has to be then put to use. And uh, there is no mechanism. It was a government of India funded project and there is no mechanism of actually immediately putting data in the open source. Uh, so now actually uh, we have uh, built a mechanism where data is going to be put on uh, a government of India website where people uh, you know, can see and download it. But uh, there has to be a you know, much more a concerted effort in getting uh, every part of India and every community sensitized in creating data and then putting it on some uh, common resource uh, location where everybody can access it and then build on the data. That is what is needed in India, certainly. But uh, the, when you came across resistance to sharing, were they, were they insights, there was the experiences there and how do you incentivize that sharing that anything you can recount, Girish? Well, uh, there are people are scared because the data might be linked to some proprietary uh, no, uh, innovation software. And I'm talking about you know, uh, the companies first and then academia also uh, are worried that the data might be linked to their research and they may not want to immediately release it. But after the publication is done and after the software has progressed to the next level, data can certainly be released in the public domain. But again, a lot of uh, uh, resources are normally uh, pumped in to create uh, data. And uh, in case of uh, you know, industry and company, they would like to get that back. So what I'm saying, if you have some model of uh, sharing like LDC of University of Pennsylvania or ELRA, you know, uh, the European Language Resource Association or Linguistic Data Consortium, I mean, these uh, organizations work on uh, membership, you know, membership, uh, institutional membership, individual membership, and you uh, uh, give your data and you get data back. So uh, this culture has to be actually uh, created in India. And uh, this is possible because I, I uh, when I had this uh, 17 university consortia and Jenny was the leader of that consortia, we realized that it is possible to do it actually. I see, that's super. Jameson, I'm sure you're, you're, you're like, I know this place, I know the situation. <laughs> Can you share your <laughs> thoughts on your efforts to conceive of the, uh, data, the legal data commons that you were looking at and the kind of barriers uh, and nudges that you came across? Sure, absolutely. Uh, so last year we did some research um, at Stanford. It was Codex, which is the Center for Legal Informatics and then also a legal design lab uh, run by a woman named Margaret Hagen. And uh, the idea was we knew there was a problem out there, which was that data was either proprietary or if it was available, it was balkanized, it was unstructured. Many of the problems that have been raised uh, on this call that applied to India also apply to the United States. And so we did some research on various sharing models that were out there and determined that a legal data commons was the best way, uh, the best way to go. Um, the barrier I think that was raised, that, that has been raised by Sachin's question um, is one of community and bringing people together. And I think a core part of that is what problem are you trying to solve and who's your audience? Who is your community? And so if the problem is NLP for legal texts, maybe you need a research community uh, based in universities or R&D labs at large legal informatic companies and, and publishers or, or within government. Um, but if what you're really talking about is advancing access to justice, the community is much bigger. Um, one of the things that we've been trying to do at Legal Hackers is to build an open grassroots community of people interested in innovation at the intersection of law and technology. And within that, one of the core, um, one of the core issues that we've been focusing on is open legal data. Uh, so working together with Harvard um, and ICL R&D, which is the R&D lab for the England and Wales law reporter, uh, we started hosting open legal data forums. Uh, we did a global one for all of our organizers and the idea was you could host each one of these within local communities uh, throughout India, throughout the world, um, in order to sensitize people to this idea of sharing, the benefits of sharing. Uh, law is a community that prides itself on confidentiality, on um, proprietary uh, tools within the publishers. And I think one that's really the core barrier is a cultural one. It's one that resides within us um, 
and it's something that only we as, as lawyers and researchers um, who've worked in the open um, can help to overcome. And so I think through workshops, bringing people together from the legal side, our specific vertical, our specific domain, and then the research side um, on the NLP, on whether it's NLP um, or legal informatics more broadly, coming together, sharing our common languages, sharing our common problems and showing that we can work together and solve them really is the way that we can overcome this. And I think ultimately, I mean, I, I wish that I could take everything that Vivek said and put it on a t-shirt and wear it around the town hall um, because it was so brilliant and so on the mark, but it really starts with community and showing people the value. Um, and so, so that's my answer, Sajan. No, I think, I think what you said about showing people the value is a really interesting thing rather than you know, lecturing or making a value laden statement, like showing people the value. And also I really appreciate what Girish said about models like uh, kind of mutual respect models if you get if you share and those kinds of things, you know, which I think are really great. Um, let me, uh, you know, a quick question to the audience and I'm gonna come to, uh, you know, whoever was talking, but quick, uh, there's a poll going out there. Are you developing uh, training, training, uh, data, uh, training data and tools? Uh, please do yes or no, please let us know. We'd like to get a flavor of what it's like. As the audience answers that uh, question, uh, I think somebody else wanted to chip in. Did, did I, did somebody else want to, uh, before I move to the next one, I kind of caught a uh, edge of something. Okay, nothing in particular. So this kind of project, if it has to be, this kind of culture, if it has to be built of sharing these tools, sharing this data, uh, are there, are there other examples of it being done in other sectors, possibly in India, uh, I don't know, Vivek uh, Costa, where you've seen it being done, like well-structured, like the nudges are good, the, the, the incentives are good, and it's moved the needle that we can draw inspiration from? Um, uh, in the healthcare uh, segment, for sure, like, you know, like, I mean, we have a similar problem in the healthcare sector as well. There are reams of documents and, you know, the, uh, and it's often um, precision, the amount of precision that is required is much higher. But I, I think um, there has been like on the web, if you search, like there'll be lots of models uh, out there, which you can kind of uh, pick up. A lot of individual action, a lot of indiv like, a, like a, a self-organized groups kind of responses. Yeah. And, uh, you know, much like, uh, you know, I, I wish there was... Uh, Something like, I mean, on GitHub itself, you would see like a lot of people like just sharing models all, all across. So, um, yeah, I, I, it's it's uh, hard to point out like one thing, but yeah. I think in other sectors like uh, healthcare, like you know, even finance, and uh, you know, there are uh, there are tools which are and, and data which is shared. Yeah. So awesome, Vivek. So. Actually, it's interesting. Uh, I mean, uh, data sharing it's it's not that common. And that's that's what one of the thing is that that it, it is not that common. But I think language, I mean, in, in legal is it's I, I take it as, as a subset of language is actually one of the areas first areas where we can do this is is, is what I think. Uh, I think that we should be sharing in all areas uh, as far as AI and, and as uh, Girish also think uh, we need to figure out the mechanisms and the models. They, they, they involve financial uh, 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 transactions also financial models uh, which could be used for uh, which could be used for we can we can hear you vivek keep going uh, vivek you're muted you'll have to unmute just unmute and, okay. yeah yeah you were saying financial, yeah, can, we'll have to think I, of financial yeah, Sorry, I'm sorry. I, I, for some well. reason, I thought yeah. that, uh, yeah, we'll have to think of financial models for also, uh, you know, that's, that's in, in, in certain that areas. For calling yeah, that I, that, I think yeah. you need to think about financial models. So, you know, there are obviously certain kinds of things that people might do for, you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, for, for various reasons, right? I mean, I think, uh, especially in this kind of an environment, actually doing some of these things uh, to be more self-reliant because one of the things is that AI requires two things, algorithms and data. And algorithms are all open and data is what you need to actually get, uh, get things done. So therefore there is, there is a certain uh, reason to actually, actually have that rallying cry. But on the other hand, you should also build financial models or other kinds of models that make it useful or make it uh, you know, easier for people to, to contribute data and work in a collaborative manner. 
So I think if some of those interesting things, if, if instead of just being purely something that is that is free, maybe there are maybe there are kind of commercial models also uh, that that get involved in there to uh, which 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 can which can help in creation of data because you know in the end yeah. a marketplace yeah of thank some you. kind. No, mm. that's thank you for calling that out. I appreciate that. You know, it should not like they might there are I can see a, a robust conversation on the chat where people are saying you know it's not all love. Uh, fairy dust and happiness you know there are uh, issues that people might be faced with in terms of uh, so quickly queuing up the results from the poll about are people creating uh, training data uh, okay wow 37% of attendees are no that's really interesting uh, that's really interesting so that's i think that's a high proportion given the diversity of attendees uh, let me just go to some of the questions because i know that uh, these questions are you know and and uh, uh, jameson i still have one question uh, I want to come back to you on which is the question around sustenance uh, of such a project, but I'll, I'll wait just for the for the, uh, uh, the to resolve some questions that are coming from the audience. So one thing that uh, qu uh, a question that has come up is, are there uh, maybe we can do one? Is there a particular use case that you're most excited by that is say, attainable in say three years? I'll go around the room. Uh, uh, maybe we can start off with uh, and let's just to broaden this out. I want Girish, uh, I, you know, I would love to even hear you, we brought you in for the diversity of perspective. I'd love to even hear you in terms of a use case for the linguistics corpora, if you can point out your favorite use case. We'll start off with maybe Kostav and then I'll, Girish, I'll come to you and pick up a, a, a use case on the corpora as well. Kostav, a single use case in say three years. You're muted. Kostav, you'll have to unmute. Sorry, <laughs> totally skipped that. Um, yeah, I would like to see like, you know, our, our, our justice system becoming more transparent, like having uh, like, for example, our crim criminal justice system, like, you know, just looking at trends of, uh, you know, uh, litigation and, and, and it, you know, it's about transparency. And if in three years time, we have places where, where average citizen can check like what's going on, um, and, and I think that'll be... Uh, awesome. That's going to be really popular with some of the judges. Like, <laughs> I can see that's really popular. <laughs> what about you, Vivek? So I think uh, one thing which I mean, I, I, which I hope can happen uh, in three years, uh, I think there's lots of things to be done, but I'm generally optimistic about stuff, is that, you know, I, I think that, you know, this NLP is actually getting good enough that, for example, if you have a bunch of documents related to a a case matter at hand and 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 somebody if they have a question about a particular thing then instead of actually someone going through the you know uh, 500 pages of documents that that, that are there uh, an answer that, that 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 gets reflected immediately out there saying that this is really the 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 uh, you know and, and it may not be related to this case may be related to some other associated case and that kind of information becomes available in real time during during court proceedings, I mean that that would be and and that would help people to actually you have so many adjournments etc that happen just because something is <laughs> is not there or somebody you can't extract the data that you need at the time that you need it. Nice one, Girish. Something in linguistics which you are super excited by use case. I think uh, uh, the translating English judgments into Indian languages would be possible uh, in the next three years. And Vivek has already done nine languages. I think the data in legal space is uh, much more uh, unstructured and less ambiguity to be expected there. So we can perhaps try translating English judgments into all 22 Indian languages. And that brings in the question of diversity of, you know, uh, the people in India, 90% do not speak English and the judgments come in English. It's a public record. It's a public record. Absolutely. Right, right. Absolutely. And there are, you know, about 672 uh, district courts in India, and most of the proceedings in those courts do not happen in English language, remember. And more than 86% pendency are in these courts, actually. Out of three crores uh, pending, uh, pending cases, more than 86% are in the district courts. So we should focus well on those uh, areas and languages. Well said, well said. And I hope to see a collaboration where you can add value on this translation piece, uh, Girish. No, absolutely. And yeah. that, would, that would be wonderful. And I think that that is our, I mean, I think if you ask, translation is obviously something where I'm involved uh, intimately. When our, but our goal is, yes, to we must get to a place where this data becomes accessible to all people in all courts. And, and then, then, you know, then you're actually talking 
something and i think it is doable i think it's doable we'll need help of everybody <laughs> and, and you know and and, and uh, but but you know but having said that we're we're moving forward <laughs> need awesome. to build a consortia you know a group of people who can actually work together in, on this problem yeah. that will really progress very well shilpa a particular use case that you are most kicked about shilpa the connection is a bit patchy but maybe can you drop it into uh, the chat please i i really want to uh, get your take on uh, use case that because i know that there's a yeah. conversation we've been having for some time on uh, a variety of areas so if you can drop that into the chat shilpa uh, jameson yeah hi um so i was going to say um contract analytics to be able to understand where terms no. of a contract but i've changed my mind after hearing from vivek and girish so I actually think that the most important thing um, and, and, and one of the most beneficial things would be um, real-time natural language translations of uh, legal judgments, but also legal transcripts mm -hmm. for indigent and uh, non-native speakers uh, for court proceedings. So the ability to understand what's going on yeah. in a court proceeding, I think would be transformational for people who otherwise would be totally inaccessible. That's, that's awesome. Uh, and uh, i know that my friends in contract automation are hating on me right now <laughs> but, but no i've I just been sitting with contracts the past couple of days and so <laughs> I, I'm, I'm, yeah uh, great uh, but uh, i want to pick up a couple more questions uh, uh, from folks please don't mind if i'm moving a little fast and trying to pick up questions uh, where required uh, any example of where already we're seeing legal data uh, and nlp transform uh, uh, law and justice in a particular country or a domain, any one that strikes the, to you, uh, strikes uh, you as being uh, inspiring? Who is that directed to, Sachin? Whoever wants to take it, yeah. And, and the question is, are there jurisdictions or countries yes, that are doing countries, it? Yes, countries where it's already ticking. So I don't know about tick. I don't know about ticking because I think it's all just beginning. But um, in London at the ICL R and D, they have a whole team there. Um, the guy who's running it is named Daniel Hoadley. He's built a number of open source tools that are focused on natural language processing for legal texts uh, using Spacey, which is open source in Python, um, and it's amazing. I mean, they're really making progress. It's really exciting. And I think they're going to lead the way in shining the light for other jurisdictions, particularly because they're within the law of reporter, which means it can come from within, not just from without government. He's in the Codex community as well, right, Jameson? I remember him being on that podcast conversation uh, with uh, a couple of people and Tucker. That's exactly right. Yeah. Uh, who, who, uh, what about anyone else who wants to point out any particular jurisdiction where they are interested in, uh, they're excited by how it's being used, legal data in NLP? Are there, are there translations, by the way, happening in any other places, uh, 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 Vivek, that you're aware of? Like in the same domain that you're digging in? No, I, yeah, I'm not aware of translation work being done. I mean, I, I suppose in India is, is kind of unique in the fact that we have so many languages that therefore it becomes something which is very important. Uh, so uh, I think that, you know, I see. Uh, yeah. I see. So I, I think see. that, yeah. uh, but maybe I, I think the European Union, there are some things because obviously between the different European Union countries, I think that uh, there, there are certain things in work in uh, because obviously both official and legal documents may need to be in multiple languages. But even there, it is not as much. I think India is actually one of the countries which probably needs this translation yeah. thing more than others. Yeah. yeah you know, uh, so just we're at time, and uh, you know, I know there's. So, th so I want to just wrap up with a couple of uh, points uh, that I think people would uh, maybe uh, re be reassured, those who have more questions. So one is this conversation is not uh, just sort of an act of let's uh, just have a fun time on Friday evening discussing NLP and data. There is a, I, I, there's a conscious effort on the part of def different entrepreneurs, organizations to really uh, you know, breathe some oxygen into the space and actually increase the access to data, access to tools, uh, and, and that is the reason why it becomes so important to see how it's been done in different parts of the world, how it's been done for other areas like linguistics, and also to tap into what, uh, you know, what the real barriers are right now. So one is this is very much about 
uh, actually the first steps of designing an initiative to move this forward and make sure that Vivek is not the only one uh, who's, who's doing this, but it's being done uh, as a broad uh, sectoral uh, open initiative. So one is that uh, we, you know, uh, it's a huge societal opportunity. The law has always been unreachable. And I can, I, I still remember that amazing slogan of MKSS, hum janenge, hum jienge. You know, that was this milestone slogan of the Right to Information Act. Hum janenge, hum jienge. And I think that we must not let go of that slogan. That slogan remains, hum janenge, hum jienge. And that must cut right through, uh, I think, for uh, this work. It's not, it may be complex in aspects of it. You know, I definitely lost my way when I was studying convolutional legal, uh, sorry, neural networks <laughs> to, to be prepared for this conversation and not feel like a complete imbecile. But I think that the reality is it has to serve real uh, use cases and it can, and it's, it's simple in its essence that it can unlock the value of information. It can make things transparent, which is so powerful. And its impact on areas like ODR, online dispute resolution, new models of legal services, uh, transparency, as Kostov uh, pointed out, accountability is just huge. So folks, be reassured uh, following this conversation, the key insights are gonna be shared by mail. Uh, the key resources, there's a list of resources, some of the stuff that I read up and other stuff that uh, Vivek pointed out, Costa pointed out, Girish's work. Uh, we are gonna create a compendium, Jameson, all the links that you shared with me in advance and stuff, we're gonna create a compendium and share it with everyone. And finally, please do treat this as an invitation to additional conversations that we want to have. Omidya, I can say uh, confidently Omidyar and Agami uh, uh, are, uh, have the conviction and uh, the commitment to make sure that we can host these conversations and hopefully see them mature into an open collaborative initiative. We already have a first version of a justice hub, uh, an, a, a repository for share, an open repository for sharing legal data that will be launched. The alpha version will be launched just in a few weeks from now. And ultimately, we want to look at those hard things that we were talking about. What are the nudges to get training data, repositories of tools to be shared? How do we take it beyond the legal, the raw data into other areas? So ultimately, we can accelerate this and, uh, and make sure that janenge bhi or jinenge bhi. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you. Wonderful. Please have a great time. Friday evening, my pizza is waiting. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.